With me today is Dan Veyes, a uh, uh, very well-regarded, well-being researcher who uh, is going to tell us about his, uh, what's your current title and institution, Dan? I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Very good, very in the, good. In the philosophy program. Very good. Um, what do you see as your main contributions to the field of well-being? Uh, in terms of research, uh, I don't think I've pushed any, any boundaries uh -huh. yet, although I hope to. Uh -huh. But I, I think my main contribution is uh, a few years ago, uh, a colleague of mine, Aaron Jarden, and I were talking and we thought there's no really interdisciplinary journal on well-being mm -hmm. that's also open access. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, we could try and make one. Uh -huh. uh, and we started asking people, and some people we knew and some people we didn't know, and, but the response was, was really great. I think people agreed that it was a good idea to have that, that kind of journal. And, um, and so now it, the first issue is in the start of 2011, and wow. it's, uh, it's really taken off, considering a lot of money is uh, usually required for these kinds of endeavours, and yes. we've basically done it on a shoestring, and uh, through just the work of academics, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm really proud of, of the journal and, and how it's come along in these few years, and, uh, and open access is it's really happening and it's spreading and I, mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I like to feel like uh, some, some of my ideas and, and Aaron's work and the other, the other editors that have, have come along has, um, have helped that. And, uh, yes. Well, it's a wonderful accomplishment. Can you um, tell us the name of your journal? It's the International Journal of Wellbeing. Okay. And, and uh, what exactly is open access for people that don't know? Uh, well, there are different kinds of open access, and but for us, what we wanted is a journal that was free for all of the people who are going to use it. Free for the authors, free for the readers, free for institutions, everyone. So the information mm -hmm. is freely available for everyone, and anybody who is contributing doesn't have to pay anything, or no author fees mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, and also no advertising. We didn't, you know, we didn't want to pollute it with advertising either. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes down to it, as long as there aren't people at the top who are getting paid a lot of money, mm -hmm. it doesn't take a lot of money to, uh -huh. to, to huh. run a journal. We, we have professional copy editing and layout and proofreading, huh. and that's it. And uh, we use open, open source software huh. uh, for the journal software. Yes, yes. And we have institutional support for um, a little bit of IT support and a little bit uh -huh. of hosting, and, uh, huh. and they also pay the, the copy editing and the layout. Uh, but that's not a lot. I mean, yeah. Well, it is a great contribution, and many are talking about the need to disseminate find, findings more broadly, more widely. Um, are these mainly professionally oriented research articles? Are there uh, articles also that the general public could uh, digest in oh, the journal? I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So no, most of our articles are standard research articles. Yes. Uh, written by, by academics. Mm -hmm. We also have a special issue that was designed mm -hmm. to be more accessible. Mm -hmm. So uh, That's real, now you're talking real open access. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh -huh. Open uh -huh. access in, in terms of the accessibility of the material as mm -hmm. well. And mm -hmm. um, that, that special issue, uh, we were lucky, it was through John Halliwell, who's uh, yes. also a part of the journal, that uh -huh. oh, he, okay. he thought that we might be the right outlet for for that, and it has the special issue has John Halliwell and lots of other very famous well-being researchers. Wonderful. Who were just trying to reach as many people as mm -hmm. they could, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's great. So they're very academic articles, but they're written in a very accessible way. Very good. Yeah, that's important. Um, any other contributions that you're uh, you'd like to uh, to share with us that you've made to the field? Um, In terms of um, public policy mm -hmm. in, in New Zealand, well-being and public mm -hmm. policy in New Zealand, I, I'm one of the few academics in New Zealand who are, are, are pushing for there to be acceptance and, and, and um, for policymakers to use the kinds of work that well-being researchers are, are creating and, mm -hmm. and uh, use it for, for good. And I, I think 
Um, so New Zealand uh, actually is fairly progressive in some ways. Mm-hmm. So the New Zealand Treasury, as a, as a ministry, has the job of evaluating the policies that come from the other ministries to see whether or not it's a good, uh, very good way to spend, good way for the government mm-hmm. to spend their money. Mm-hmm. And they uh, have developed a living standards framework. Mm-hmm. So it's using this broad perspective of well-being and mm. to evaluate the different policies. So and not not just the uh, financial or physical capital mm-hmm. and th- that work uh, started a, uh, a few years ago and Ben Gleisner uh, wrote the initial report, a lot uh-huh. of people were involved mm-hmm. um, and I, I was teaching a, an adult education course at, at the same university, Victoria University of Wellington mm-hmm. and, and the, the course I was was about well-being and public policy and mm. So I wanted to take what I know from philosophy, but also f- that I've learned from social science, yes. and try and say, here's what I think the implications are for everyday people, mm-hmm. and also for public policy. And, Very good. And um, a, a lot of that is me synthesizing other work that lots of other people have synthesized, you know, a whole yeah. lot, of, a lot yeah. of work. And Ben Gleisner was in the audience mm. uh, for this uh, little lecture series mm-hmm. that I gave, and, and then it, we got got in touch after that and uh, and he, he wrote the policy hmm. but uh, I'd like to think that Amazing. I, I might have had a, 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 a <laughs> that's very good well and I think there's a lot to be said for um, synthesizing the work and uh, you know spreading the word and um, not always having to do original research uh, and to uh, to put it in plain language expose policy makers to it um, so um, it sounds like you do have some uh, uh, some ideas for public policy implications. Could you share any of those with us today? Uh, yeah, well, I, first of all, I think it's great that different um, national statistical offices around the world are starting to think about well-being more broadly and, and measure more. Mm-hmm. But I, I still don't think we're measuring enough. Mm. And, and I know it costs money to, mm-hmm. to measure these things, uh, but I, I think it's worth it. Okay. Especially considering some of the things that some governments uh, spend money on. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, I think we should spend more money on measuring more more different types of well-being. So mm-hmm. what we have at the moment is little groups get together and they, they start measuring their their version of, of well-being. Mm-hmm. And they try and they try and keep it going or they use some kind of sampling methods and it dies off and uh, we do have some big international uh, groups that Mm -hmm. do measures and they keep going but I would just like to see a way and it would be complicated but for more communication across the different groups Mm -hmm. so that we can better find out um, who's measuring what and let's work together and let's try and get really good sampling and really consistent mm-hmm. measures and we'll go back and we'll ask again and I mean the World Value Survey mm-hmm. it is excellent and mm-hmm. it's just available mm-hmm. for research to, researchers to use which is wonderful and, yeah. uh, there's, and it allows people like me who might not have the resources to conduct big studies of yes. my own to, to just run studies of other people's mm-hmm. data and, and, yeah. and try and add to the, the conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that way, but uh, but I think we need to measure more things, and I think that the governments need to get involved because with the um, the national statistical officers, mm-hmm. they can do, get really good samples, and they can do annual surveys, mm-hmm. uh, for, and so we can get really good high quality data. And my advice would be so let's start doing that if we're not already, and lots of countries are now thinking of doing. Yes, that. but I would say let's measure a wide variety of things mm-hmm. now. Can you can you share some? Uh Constructs that we should measure that maybe have not always been considered um, yeah, for sure. along with traditional well-being. And so, for policymakers, what they think is we want our and national statistical officers, especially, they want their mm-hmm. measures to be used. And so they think, okay, well, we have to make sure that it's popular with the academics, but mm-hmm. it's also that um, we can compare it with other countries. Mm-hmm. So it has to be popular with other countries and has to be measures that, not new measures, but old measures that we've already been collecting for a while, otherwise mm-hmm. we can't have trends and, and so on. And so lots of um, lots of these organisations will end up using the old measures. We'll yes. just use a satisfaction with life. Yes. We'll use the, the 
Cantrell ladder. Yes, yes. Yellow question. Something from fifty or sixty years yeah. ago. And and I uh, I think they should. Mm -hmm. But I think we also need to ask other questions. And so. What are some of the other questions we're now addressing? So from philosophy, um, and my contribution mm -hmm. to the the project here about the history of philosophy, mm -hmm. there's all these different ideas about what well-being really is. Mm -hmm. and for philosophy, being satisfied with your life is just one of several major different kinds of philosophy mm -hmm. and there are theories in psychology that, that reflect these mm -hmm. so the hedonic theory as well and, mm -hmm. um, and the, of the emotions and the affects and there are measures of those so I think government should also um, mm -hmm. have at least some measures of affect and so uh, they needn't be the uh, the older yeah. uh, multi-item methods necessarily we can ask um, did you laugh Frequent, or laugh or smile frequently uh -huh. yesterday. And questions like that. They mm -hmm. can be simple, but they just need to get at that um, kind of thing. Yes. Um, but then we also, I think, we need to measure everything that people value, and so families or social relationships, whether or not they're they're lonely, whether or not mm -hmm. they think their life is meaningful, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And um, if we measure all of those things, some people might say, "Ah, oh, but." Actually, that's not so important in our culture, or that's not mm -hmm. so important now. Mm -hmm. But one of the things about studying the history of well-being is, is I can see that people's views on what's valuable, what's important in life, just changes. And sometimes mm -hmm. it changes back to, to what it was in an earlier time. And if we, if we want to be able to make policy decisions, then I think if we measure a broad range of things from now, and we keep measuring them, then some of them will come in and out of fashion and, mm -hmm. and people will think they're more important or less important. If something's truly a dead duck, we can just let it go, maybe add, add something else in as mm -hmm. technology changes, you know, life and our values will change and so we need to try and keep track of those things. Mm -hmm. and then we can have a big range of things and, and we can start, if we have really good measures over a long period of time and good sampling, we can really start to run detailed studies and find out about causation, and, and, mm -hmm. and which mm -hmm. is what we need to know for policy. Yes, and, yes, yes. And, and th then my, what I think would be great is that politics could be based on policies towards these different views of well-being, these different mm -hmm. values, so there can be education in there. So the same kinds of things that are talked about in politics, but let's come up with nicely defined ways of measuring them. And so mm -hmm. for, for some people they might say happiness, uh, as life satisfaction or, or as positive emotions, that is what I think is really important and I yeah. think the government should have that on their agenda. And then go, uh, d different political parties can say, these are our key agendas, these, mm -hmm. these are the, the well-being outcomes that we will try and pursue with our policies and well they can rank them and then people can, because then with the, with academics can go on and they can assess how effective governments have been. Uh, there's a lot of things to tease out, but if we yeah. had, if mm -hmm. we do measure all this wide variety of things, mm -hmm. then we have our best chances of doing that. And so we can actually get to the point where we can pick our political parties based on whether or not they actually can achieve mm -hmm. the, um, progress in the values that we have uh, yes. uh, as individuals. And yes. Imagine if people could vote on that instead of election promises where... Right. For most of the key components of well-being, they all they all agree. They say, "Oh yes, of course, we want to improve education and health, health and all these things." But we have different ways of mm -hmm. of, of doing it, and they, they disagree on, on some of the other factors. Yeah. But if we can truly evaluate the differences in their effectiveness, uh, the effectiveness of their policies for the those core values, then I think mm -hmm. uh, politics there could be a, a turn where people get more interested in politics. Mm -hmm. um, and for the right reasons and in the right ways, and it will make it a, a better, more true democracy. If, yes, yes. If, if we're and part of what you're saying is looking at the well-being impact of policies and government programs mm -hmm. on a routine basis. Yeah. And you're also, it sounds like, uh, speaking of um, measuring uh, what some researchers would call. Um, domains of you know mm -hmm. uh, well-being that are they're fairly well established even things like from a philosophical perspective you know purpose in life mm -hmm. is uh, and having life goals uh, has been pretty reliably related to well-being along with uh, things like relationships and the quality of relationships and things like that so 
that may not even be that radical uh, uh, of a proposal. Yeah. So not to the academics who, who study well-being, but to mm -hmm. the policy makers. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and when I've talked to them, uh, so in New Zealand, in the Treasury, unfortunately, yeah. subjective well-being was in there, mm -hmm. with, along with social capital, natural capital, and, mm -hmm. and those things, which should also be there, mm -hmm. economic capital. Mm -hmm. And then subjective well-being has dropped out again. Okay. As, as they've moved from, here's the framework to, here's the tool for how we will analyze uh, individual policies, mm -hmm. with the justification being, well, all of these more objective measures, they they all contribute to subjective well-being, and mm -hmm. so maybe we don't need subjective well-being. Uh -huh. Which I so, think is a, is a bit of a shame, because uh, uh, if subjective, really what we're after is well-being, mm -hmm whatever that is, yeah. and there's different ways to try and get at what that is, and these objective measures and the subjective measures are, are all just different ways to try and yes. get at what that is, in, in my opinion. And so yes, but to get rid of the subjective well-being is, um, is really removing a very core element of it. So, um, mm. But it's wonderful you're doing this uh, advocacy work, and does this relate to your business background a little bit, that you've learned how to... Uh, or are you just not afraid to deal with these policy makers? Uh, I, th I have a very strong interest in doing academic research that mm -hmm. isn't just ignored. And, and, yeah, I hear you. And, and, it's, and I know I, I enjoy so much of this research and I mm -hmm. think it's so important. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I do, and also you know, maybe I'll end up in policy and, and not, okay. not as a researcher. And so I'm still trying to find a permanent job. I'm very early in my career and it's... Yes, you are very it's, early. It's, so you, you might even consider a political career yourself. Yeah, pr probably not pol Possibly. politics, but, but policy. Yeah, yeah, policy. Okay, yeah. very good. Very good. Sure. Um, and um, any of your research you wanted to, to mention or any other contributions you'd like to mention um, um, besides this? And they've been substantial. I just wonder if there's anything else you want to highlight. So I have I've done a lot of work this year with Mose and Josh and Lou. Uh, uh -huh. who, who is also um, from Wellington, who's yes. an exceptional uh, scholar uh -huh. and a cross-cultural psychologist. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we teamed together. He always wanted to work with a philosopher, uh -huh. uh, he told me. So we started working together and it was it's worked very well. And so mm -hmm. we've written five papers wow. together this year. And a lot of the papers are about... Um, so we might take a, a philosophical idea or a philosophical theory and then go and, go and test it uh, on different data sets if we can, but in, in a very global way if we can. So our studies cover between 74 and 124 countries, I think. Wow. So we're really trying to get a good spread. And Can you give us an example of a philosophical concept you decided to, to mm -hmm. validate or explore? So one of, one of our papers is about the meaning of life. And, mm -hmm. So we wanted to write about that, and there's this question uh, in the the World Value Survey that basically no one has ever written on, mm -hmm. and it's uh, the question is, do you think about the meaning and purpose of life? Mm -hmm. How often do you think about mm -hmm. the purpose and meaning of life? And no one's really so, and they initially the correlation with life satisfaction is not significant, mm -hmm. and so maybe for that reason. Uh, people didn't pick it up, but it's also quite unclear what the question's getting at. Mm -hmm. um, but it, to me, it's like, well, it's that's the kind of thing that philosophers are supposed to be yes. thinking about the, the meaning and, and the uh -huh. purpose of life. Um, but we we looked closer and we thought, well, um, there's this philosopher, well, a philosopher and, and a novelist, Tolstoy, mm -hmm. and uh, so we, for me, I was coming from his experience, which mm -hmm. was he. he um, he was strictly atheist and he thought religion was abhorrent mm -hmm. and um, and then one day he got to th th but he was very successful in everything he did mm -hmm. and then he, one day he got to th thinking about why am I doing this what is the point of, of this so what is the point of me being a loving father mm -hmm. what is the point of me writing this, mm -hmm. this this book and becoming famous for my books and he and he, he thought that science is you know, we just die and in, in the end, yeah. and, and and so does everyone else that we might affect, and so maybe everything comes to nothing, and he became deeply depressed, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and in the end he he thought, well, actually everyone else around here, their life's a lot worse than mine, and they they don't care about what I care about, they're getting on, they're doing, mm -hmm. they're doing okay.
okay. And, and it was religion for mm -hmm. them uh, mm -hmm. that allowed them to do that. And, and so there was a couple of things we noticed there that, so religion seems to be a buffer against mm -hmm. meaninglessness. Mm. And um, also globalization and, and as the spread of ideas. So the theory that we put forward in the paper is the more that ideas spread, uh -huh. um, especially ideas about religion or not religion or, or whether or not you should find certain things meaningful in life, the more of those ideas that spread, the less confidence you might have in any particular view mm -hmm. of why your life is meaningful or it has purpose. So you might be, for example, if you're religious, you might be oh, second-guessing your religion given that you've just worked out there's all these other people in these other countries with very different religions. Mm -hmm. And so they might cast out on your religion being the true religion, if that's the source of meaning in oh. your life. And so we... Um, we tested globalization and religiosity mm -hmm. as moderators between thinking about the meaning and purpose in life and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, if you were religious and you thought about the meaning of life mm -hmm. a lot, then you might be more satisfied mm -hmm. with your life. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't have a religion, and especially, uh, or if you're in a, a, a country that's exposed to more globalization than other countries, then you might think, oh, I'm really unsure about whether or not it's possible for there to be a meaning or purpose of life. And so yeah. the more you think about it, it'll make you less mm -hmm. satisfied with your life. And we found that um, both of those hypotheses, so the one about globalization, uh, being exposed to globalization, yeah. making it worse for you to think about the meaning of life was true, mm. and being, being religious made it easier. As, uh -huh. So the more you thought about life, the more satisfied yeah. you were. And uh, but for religiosity, it was only attendance uh, mm -hmm. and not just belief in the importance of God. Mm -hmm. And we tried to explain that by saying that uh, if you just believe in the importance of God, you might not be able to use that belief to explain fully to yourself mm -hmm. the way that you understand how your life can be meaningful, mm -hmm. given the existence of God. But if you attend the religious services regularly, mm -hmm. then there's someone who is trained in explaining it to you basically here's how yes. this religion allows you to get meaning and, and purpose in your life yes and the religious community or congregation or sangha or whatever can help to support you when you get confused maybe about that so um well i think that's another great contribution that you're making when you're trying to translate philosophical concepts into testable hypotheses mm -hmm. so um uh, I applaud you on your work, and I thank you for uh, sharing some of these wonderful initiatives that you've uh, started, and uh, hope that you continue, continue this great work, and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Okay. So.